I wonder if that was planned. That was all coordinated. Today. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> the contacts that yeah. they brought in for me. I think that's a starting point why you are the yeah. spokesperson for the brand. Yeah, maybe. Part. <laughs> don't hide these though, kids. Oh no, but I'm sure you've They're not even in shot hand, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I read you studied marine biology yeah. in college. Yeah. And did you go into acting while you were still in college? Or how did you transition? No, it from found, it found me because I did it when I was a little kid, huh? Okay. So I was a little kid. My mom was hot when she was younger. My mom was a model. And mm -hmm. so she got married at 18, had me at 20. Uh -huh. And her agent wanted her to start going out again. Okay. And so, and she pressed my mom to bring me in as well. So I started doing stuff when I was a little kid. And then I did it through junior high, like elementary school and all that. But junior high, I was like, I just wanted to play sports and all that stuff. But at that point, I'd been around enough to where this guy remembered me. Here I was doing the college thing. And uh, my friends were graduating with different degrees because I did the, I chose to go the community college route because there was just more freedom. You know, I'm a transient, right? So, you know, one semester here, one semester there, and kind of figured things. Uh, besides, my parents were rich and just putting me through university like all my friends were. So, um, at least that was my mentality at the time. And uh, so, just just being around for a while trying to figure out what was going on. My friends were graduating with different degrees and they had amassed huge student loans. And it terrified me because I just started university level and I was like, oh no, that means I can grow up. <laughs> and so, I wanted to take some time off and just kind of reassess everything to make sure I was heading in the direction that I wanted to. And this casting director remembered me from when I was a little kid, and he managed to track me down. Now this time I was living on a friend's couch in San Clemente, and I was bussing tables at a restaurant. Mm -hmm. And so this guy retrieves me, calls me into town, they wanted like a 1960s throwback character for this television show called Touched by an Angel. The casting director was this guy, David Giello. So I, I went in and I read, and he, I got the part. I went and worked for four days, came home, and he was like, scouting report came back really well. He was like, what are you doing right now? I said, I'm just trying to figure out what I'm doing. <laughs> and he said, well, he's like, well, while you're figuring that out, he's like, if you were auditioning, I think you would work all the time. And I didn't know like how real that was, but I auditioned, I got Pleasantville. I was excited because I was able to pay off some of the money that was against me now with my credit cards and all that stuff. And then I thought that would be it. And then that turned into another one, which turned into another one. I thought, okay, cool. Now I'm going to be able to go back to college. That was always the plan. Mm -hmm. It was a means to an end, right? Mm -hmm. Go back and finish school. Right. Well, then I found out I was going to have a kid. So I was like, oh, great. I guess, I guess school's off. But the good thing was that I was working. At least I was making money, and I knew I was going to be able to provide. And I wouldn't have to work at UPS anymore, because in between jobs, I wasn't making that much yet. So you were working, working at, at UPS. UPS. Did, did you get recognized as you were making the deliveries? No, no, no. Just, no. It was if, you're still... deliver, if you're delivering, like you're somebody. That's oh, okay. Yeah, so you that's, aspire to be delivered. Yeah. So what is the mail room equivalent? No, the, you know, you, you work, well, I was working San Fernando Bell, okay, and they had, I was working two-day air, which was like, if you're working two-day air, that means you know what you're doing, you know, like, you, can, <laughs> you can pack a truck to maximum density, right? uh -huh. and so I was doing that, and uh, I really, there was a point where I was like, well, you know, whatever, I, maybe go back to school. Being a UPS driver wouldn't be bad if you had a good route. Because I had friends that were doing it, or new guys that were doing it, mm -hmm. and they were, those are the guys that got the routes in small beach communities, mm -hmm. and the routes are relatively small. They make their deliveries because if you race through it as UPS driver, you get off earlier. Right? Exactly. But don't speed. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, well, how bad would that be? I mean, if you're living in a small town like say San Clemente, right, mm -hmm. for instance, which is where I was at, I was like, I could have my route, be done at three o'clock, be surfing before, you know surfing before sundown and catching glass off. I mean, that was my mentality. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, found, found out I was going to be a kid. That was big. I was going to have a kid. That was huge. That was, that was the life changer for me. And uh, all of a sudden then, it wasn't a question. It was, it was what I needed to do. And it was funny because from job to job, I was afraid. Before, I was like, oh, if it's my last one, who cares? Now, all of a sudden, it was like, this is my last job. This is going to be hard because I don't have a degree. I don't have anything behind me. You know, I came up on the short term. Hopefully this will continue out. So as soon as I figured out a game plan and I did it in my mind, I was like, I set aside the just in case one, which was like, okay, cool. I know I'm covered. I can go back to school. I can cover fatherhood, make sure my daughter's taken care of and have time to go and figure that all out. And I just haven't had to tap that yet. <laughs> so I'm like, I just turned 38. I'm like, oh, I never had to go back to school, but I still want to go back. That's the funny thing. So, you know, I, I, 
I dedicated, re, really committed myself for the first time uh, just before my 38th birthday. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to go bananas for the next two years. And in my 40s, I'll have the flexibility to do whatever I want to do. So we'll see whether it's stay in this or, or finally go back to school and finish up. We'll see. But I think 40s are cool. I'm excited. Mm -hmm. So you just got to experience a bit of it with the National Ge Geographic series? Yeah. How well, did it's, it's funny that come about? That, was, that wasn't a series, right? <laughs> no? No, I was, well, it turned into one. Oh, okay. You know, I was like, I thought it was. Yeah, so it's the marine yeah. biofix, right? Yeah. I'm trying to figure out ways where I can have my cake and eat it too. Yeah. So I started working with this group called the Billfish Foundation. Mm -hmm. And we're going out, we're catching these giant billfish, and we're reeling them in, and we can feel good about it, because as opposed to just catching them and killing them. Right? Yeah. We're bringing them on board. We're taking a little sample of their, you know, pectoral fin or their mm -hmm. dorsal fin for a DNA sample. We're drawing blood and we're putting a bunch of equipment on them. Yeah. Satellite tags, pet tags, all this stuff, and then we release them. So we can monitor their numbers. They're a great species to study because they're an apex predator. They sit at the top of the food chain. And unlike schooling fish, you can actually see them basking. So it's easy to kind of get an idea of numbers. So I'm working and I'm doing that. And they're like, oh, we want you on the board of the foundation and all that. Well, I meet this guy, Chris Fisher. We're like-minded guys. He's on the board as well. His dad, his dad invented the, the soda dispenser. Right? Oh, thanks. So, yeah, so, but he's but he's a doer. Okay, so he goes off. He studies international business in Singapore. I mean, the guy he's made something of himself, and I I dig the guy. So, anyways, he has this idea because we've been doing this with billfish. Coincidentally enough, another guy on the board is this guy, Michael Dolmeyer. He's a doctor. He's one of he's just an amazing marine biologist, one of the leaders in, um, in, um, in uh, uh, elephant seals and also great white sharks. And so he looks at Chris's ship and we come up with this whole idea of, hey, maybe we can get great white sharks on this platform. So it started off as kind of like a dare and kind of a challenge. Chris has a production company because of all the daddy's soda pop money. <laughs> and he's done really well with fishing shows. So he's a world-class angler on ESPN2. He's won Emmys and he's done all this stuff. And so he's like, I got the camera crew. If we're gonna go into temple, let's just bring the camera crew out there. So we bring the camera crew out there. We got permits from the Mexican government to catch six great white sharks off of Guadalupe Island. We don't know we're gonna catch anything. Like nobody even made a fish hook that was substantial enough to catch these sharks. So we literally took what was a decorative, like ornamental shark that Mustad made. These guys would hang it in the back of bars, like you know, in fishing town. Uh -huh. Like, oh, it's a great white shark hook. But it wasn't even forged, it was just pressed metal. So we're like forging <laughs> these hooks, trying to get the metallurgy up so it can withstand catching yeah. one of these sharks, not sure if it's going to or not. They're bending them straight and all that. And we managed to get some, and we come back with the footage and show Nat Geo and show Discovery Channel. They're like, mm -hmm. look, we want it. Yeah. <laughs> That's how it happened. So it's That's funny awesome. because it's like, Nat Geo's like, oh, we got shark men. <laughs> he just went to the highest bidder, you know? and Chris is floating. And I'm, I'm happy for him because he ruled big. Yeah. You know, it was, a, it was a major, major endeavor. And, you know, they're still going. They're going strong. And I've been working more with Michael Dolmeyer, who is the, the scientist in season mm -hmm. one. We got along really well. So, um, is there a potential second season or maybe? Well, they did a second season. To be honest with you, I haven't spoken with Chris in a while. We were miss, we we're missing each other, and he's so busy with it. And uh, they wanted to get me out on the boat again. And I was coming down. Actually, with Jesse and I called up my friend who's here, and I called up Chris just to find out what was going on with the show because mm -hmm. I wanted to get back out there on the boat again. But um, was it ever terrifying? Did you have any of those? Uh... Well, you know, I'm gonna say no, and I don't want you to think I'm. Doing it. <laughs> I'm not being a cool guy when I say this, all right? Okay. But the thing of it is, it's like you hook into one of these sharks, and you know they're, you know, probably 15, 20 years old, right? <laughs> so you're like, the size isn't. It's like wow. They, Things big, and you're hoping you're gonna catch the mother of all mothers, right? The idea is 20 feet because you know they're out there, and people speculate, oh, maybe that one's 20 foot, but the water magnifies yeah. the size of the mm -hmm. shark, and so we're guesstimating. We caught 18, 18, 6, close to 19 yeah. foot, but nobody's caught a 20 footer. First off, we've set and broken the record for largest fish ever caught in at least four times, right? Mm -hmm. So nobody <laughs> kill 20 footers, but the challenge isn't catching the shark, it's catching the shark and making sure it swims away. You can catch them all day long and kill them yeah. dead, right? So we're like, we don't want to kill this thing. No. So that's what you're amped up on. It's not the adrenaline it's actually catching it. Alive. It's like, yeah. let's get this thing out of here. Let's do what we got to do mm -hmm. for science. Let's take the blood. Let's tag it. Let's do all those things. Yeah. Let's not forget why we're here. And let's get that thing off and make sure it swims away. Because wow. if it dies on us, we're all bummed out. Yeah. Because this thing's far more awesome than any one of us. Yeah. That, that's the like-minded kind of mentality yeah. we all have. And, um, where am I going with this whole thing? 
Um, oh yeah, yeah. So it's scary. not until it's yeah. away in the end, you look back and you go, <laughs> that thing was huge, right? you know? Like, there was one that we caught, and uh, I called her the giant toad, and I think her name was Kimberly. Mm -hmm. And she was so big, like, I'm a pretty tall guy. And we gotta figure out how to open this, sh this, this shark's mouth to get the hook out of it. And the shark is so <laughs> massive, right? And the head is so big and it's so powerful. The only thing I could do is, like, put a foot on oh, either side God. of it and grab it by its nose and open its mouth, right? The thing was so big, I was on my tiptoes and can barely get around enough to get leverage to open the thing's mouth. That's how big they wow. are. So, you know, I can't even you do more that, terrifying, honestly. You know, it's awesome. <laughs> so in the middle of it, it's like, yeah, you're cognizant, you're aware of it. You're like, wow, this thing's really big, you know? And Brett's like half reaching his arm, like almost, and they're grabbing the snorkel out. And I'm like, oh, that's crazy. I better not let go. You know? <laughs> 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 you really trust me right now? And I'm not letting go. There's just no way. And uh, yeah, it swims away at the end of it. And you just, there's so many little things that come together. And the longest we've had one out of the water was just over 18 minutes. So, you know, we're taking kind of educated kind of guesses because the biologists that are on the boat, like how long can this thing survive out of water? Even though we're pumping water over its gills to make sure that it remains oxygenated, we don't really know. Nobody's ever done this before. So we're like, well, we've done 18 minutes and 20 seconds. So if it's in the water before 18 minutes and 20 seconds, we're good. But when you get down to like 16 minutes, 17 minutes, mm -hmm. and you got that 18, 20 ticking in the back of your mind, and you're looking down at your wristwatch and someone's counting it out, the last thing you're thinking about is that shark getting you, or like, oh no, you're yeah. like, let's get it off the platform. Right. Like I said, when that thing swims away, you're like, oh, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so, it's so much fun. But uh, yeah, it's definitely, definitely an addiction. I can imagine adrenaline. It's, it's, yeah, it's it's cool, it's cool, and it's just it's so humbling, you know. Because the thing of it is, it's like you know, they have this. You know, you look at the great white shark. You look in its eye, especially you know it's Atlanta. It's, I've never had the pleasure. No, <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay, shots, right? it's just a big black ominous eye. You're like that thing is pure death. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, <laughs> they are. They're eating machines. I don't care what anybody says. Yeah. They don't care. They're no. opportunistic. People go, oh, it was Miss ID, that's why he let me go. A no. great white shark is a smart shark. Because unlike a tiger shark, great white shark, he hits you, he puts one mortal wound on you because he knows it's mortal. And then sits back and waits for his prey to bleed out before mm. he eats him. So when people make it to shore, they go, oh, it was mis mistaken identity. It's like, no, dude, he just didn't bleed out fast yeah. enough <laughs> for him to finish you off, you know? But you get up there and you, you look in this ominous eye and how spooky they are, and I'm like, oh, I'm terrified. Because there's no like no people's mistake. around, it's just literally jet black. Yeah. yeah. You can't see into no. their soul. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? But the thing of it is, it's like you get up there with it and you're like, yeah, make no mistake, this guy's just a stone cold killing eating machine. Mm -hmm. I mean, during gestation period, there may be as many as two or three babies in the womb. They eat one another, the strongest survives. That's the life of a great white shark, right? Just to put it in perspective. They eat their brothers and sisters in the womb, right? So, you get up close to it and it's like, yeah, I'm definitely just afraid of these things. They're gnarly, they're definitely scary, they're an eating machine, but you know what, they are so pure in their purpose, and that's the respect that comes. Yeah. And so it's like, with the respect, the fear almost dissipates, right? Mm -hmm. Almost. Almost, yeah. <laughs> I don't think mine would be going anywhere. <laughs> Not anytime fast. They're, they're an awesome, awesome animal. So to change gears a little bit, you have a non-profit. Yeah. I was reading about. How did that come about? Um, my good friend, really. Because mm -hmm. it was just an idea that I had a couple of times. And I travel a lot, a lot of third world countries. I spent a lot of time in Indonesia and um, Central America. And you just fall in love with the people. Indonesia's cursed. is where they're at. They're on yeah. fault lines. They have earthquakes, tsunamis. It seems like all the time. And so I was there um, not too long ago. And I saw another earthquake. And I was like, this is sucks. These people always get slammed, and I start getting angry. Mm -hmm. like, you start getting emotional because you think about the friends and the people that you met. My buddy's with me, and I'm like, wow. every time I see this, it's like my heart goes out, and I just want to be there. And he's like, hey, why don't you just start going? I said, you pay for it. Why don't you go on this and go help out? And I was going, yeah, that'd be cool. Talk is cheap, right? Yeah. Well, that same friend, Haiti, happened. He's here today. So he called me up, and he's like, I'm going to give you the guy talk. He's like, yo, pussy. Like, he's like, you going? I'm like, going where? He's like, Haiti. And then it, some other profanity, some other words follow it. Up. And he's like, oh, look, man. He's like, if you go, I'll go with you. That's pretty cool. So we had no idea what we were getting into. We made some phone calls to our friends that are firefighters and paramedics, and we just went for it. So it was five friends, and we went in. And the whole thing was, 
let's just not become liability. Let's go in completely self-sufficient. So we went in with five gallons of water each on our back, wow. which, you know, and then we each had two duffel bags. My mother's a nurse for all these pharmaceuticals and stuff. And I shouldn't have had, my mom's awesome. <laughs> and so we were able to go in and we found this orphanage. We went in and we dumped a bunch of stuff. And you know, next thing I know, I'm running to Port-au-Prince and yeah. I commandeered a car. And I run out onto the tarmac where Airborne is and they have all these, you know, the infamous bottleneck. All these supplies are sitting on the tarmac. Nobody could even get there to retrieve them. And so when I came in, I saw all this stuff. We're hanging out at the UN. I'm watching, what's his face? Who's the guy? Anderson Cooper. Yeah. <laughs> Posture, like he's like in the thick of it all. When the UN's right across the street, he's standing on a rubble pile. Like he's in like the most garbage. He's such a poser. <laughs> I saw. He's an actor. So, anyways, a graffiti behind him and everything. It looked really good. But, uh, <laughs> So anyways, we, we, I get in there and I, I drive out onto the tarmac and I get the guys coming after me, you know, what are you doing here with the tarmac? I'm like, yo, I jump out of the car with this guy, Hastings, awesome brother, and he's from New Orleans. And he's like, where are you going? He goes, holy shit, man, what are you doing here? I'm like, yo, I just, I gotta get some stuff. We're at this orphanage. We need some, like, baby formula. We need some extension cords because we got generators and we can't run power. He's like, hold on one second. He's like, yo, you aren't going to believe what's here right now. Like, who's that? Like, that dude, Paul Walker, he's like, who the hell's that? He's like, the guy from Fast and Furious. He's like, Vin Diesel? He's like, no, the <laughs> <laughs> so, the next thing I know, this guy comes running out, and he's like going, boom, boom, boom. They just start raping the runaway and giving us everything they can. And I got back, and I was like, oh, that was easy. You know, we were there for four or five days. Yeah. Where we set up a field hospital adjacent to this orphanage, when we got there, there was only 47 people. At the time we left, me, my four friends, and two doctors, there was just under 400 people. Wow. All laid out, field hospitals. They let us take a bunch of tents. I went back, we set up all these field tents and everything. So, you know, we went there not wanting to be liabilities, hoping that we can make a difference. My buddy called me up, we put it into action, and it worked. And so we were like, now we're empowered, right? So it's still just an idea with some like-minded friends. Chile happened within a couple of months. It was like, round two, here we go. We went, the group got bigger. We have a doctor now, a medical doctor, uh -huh. because of our experiences there in Haiti. Uh -huh. We managed to poach one or two. Uh -huh. And uh, and then we ended up going to Indonesia. And then next thing I know, my, my accountant, everyone's like, well, look, if you're gonna be doing this, you should just like make it work, make uh -huh. it real. And maybe yeah. we can raise some money to keep it going. And, uh, yeah, it's just, it's swelling. We did Tuscaloosa this year. This year's been sleepy, which has been awesome, because last year, it seemed like every three months there was something. <laughs> was something last year was bad. Yeah, Last terrifying. year was really bad, so I almost wish I shouldn't have said that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but, like, um, no, it's, it's awesome. It's my favorite thing to do. I, I love it so much, and the, the talent pool that we have now is just, it's just incredible, because it's, just, it's like a contagion. You know, we put it out there, people like, it's just an opportunity. Because firefighters and stuff here, all those guys, especially paramedics, those guys are like grunts. You gotta have them in an environment like that. You go with just a bunch of doctors, you know, not to talk, not doctors, yeah. but to, they don't want to like, You can't get down and dirty. Yeah. 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 You need to have that balance. And I think that's where we're unique because we go in with guys that are willing to like hump loads mm -hmm. and like carry stuff out. Urban search and rescue, so they know shoring, they know how to jack stuff up to extract people from falling debris. A doctor can't do that. They know how to deal with crush damage on the immediate, and then you can pass them over, especially the paramedics because they know the doctor lingo, which is good. EMT doesn't know it. Paramedic can actually communicate directly with the doctor. So it's nice having those, especially when we're triaging and setting different things up. And so uh, it's, it's, it's going really well. It's, it's, it's fun. Do you think there's anything to your left can do? I know we're wearing skirts and I have 120 so fashion you know vlogs in Los yeah. Angeles. I'm now, sure we could get down yeah, and say. Now, now the thing is, if, you, if people want to go, you have to have a minimum of EMT certification. Uh, that was a cool challenge for people. Yeah. Because yeah. in three weeks, you can have it at UCLA. Uh, they have an impacted course. It's five days a week, it's eight hours a day, okay. and one Saturday. So in total, uh, it's 16 days. Uh, but it's. Yeah. Cool. Not 16 days, excuse me. Uh, what would that be? Uh, 21, uh, 22 days. Okay. 22 days of school, or something like that. Cool. But, um, Sorry. Anyhow, I'm getting yeah. too excited. That's right. It was all good. We didn't ask any Davidoff questions. Sorry. You didn't? Yay, Davidoff! Uh, <laughs> at the end. Well, no, we, we did in the beginning. I made a commentary about how his blue eyes. Blue eyes are Davidoff. Maybe one last question about Davidoff. Okay. Cool. <laughs>
So we saw, you know, the, the commercial, the amazing commercial you made for Davidoff uh, right before this interview. Did you do all of your own stunts? I saw you were dying. No, my dad, my dad <laughs> sucked. My double, actually, the guy that doubles me, doubled me forever is so funny because we went to high school together. Our mothers went to high school together. Wow. Yeah, so, like, we grew up, our mothers changing our diapers side uh-huh. by side. In kindergarten, he wrote, he, in kindergarten, he wrote a paper. His very first paper was, uh, was like, a paragraph. When I grew up, I wanted to be a stuntman. Awesome, right? So now he's a kick-ass stuntman. We get there, we got to do this thing. He's like, oh, man, he's like, I can't believe it. He's like, because he and his wife just had a baby together. Uh-huh. He's like, he's like, they really want me to come out for you. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess. He's like, well, what kind of stunts are you going to be doing? I'm like, oh, just driving and stuff. And blah, blah, blah. He's like, well, you do the driving stuff better than I do. I'm like, yeah, sometimes. But anyways, I'm being humble. We're kind of messing with each other a little bit. We get out there. He's like. He's like, yeah, I guess, I guess it's some big dive that they want you to do. And I'm like, well, how big? And he's like, I don't know, like, maybe like 60 feet swan dive. And I'm like, well, dude, I've never done 60 feet. I've jumped from 60 feet, but it's swan dive. So he gets out there and he practices a little bit. And he goes, it's so funny because all the local guys that saw him do it, they thought he was a professional diver. <laughs> His dive came up. It looked good. So he only did it twice. And he's like, yeah, man. He's like, it came out really good. I'm like, how good? And he's like, check it out on the iPhone. Tommy, you got it. That's his wife. <laughs> That was sick. Thanks for making me look at it. Mine was not good. Let's just say that. Okay.